Good evening, church. Uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We are grateful uh, to be uh, back in Bible study. Uh, those of you at Stone and at St. Paul know we've been uh, going through uh, the book Transitioning uh, by Dan Sutherland. Um, and it's entitled Transitioning and Leading a Church Through Change. And um, I wanted to share, uh, go back over, uh, if we could, chapter uh, one, just to walk through it briefly. And then uh, next week we'll pick it, pick back up on chapter two. Good to see everyone, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, we're grateful how God is keeping us uh, during this uh, pandemic pause. It has uh, caused the church uh, to not uh, stop being the church, but uh, we realize that uh, we have to. Uh, meet this present age with, uh, uh, in different ways. And so we're grateful for what God is doing and what God is um, leading us to do uh, through this pandemic. So I want to I wanna do that. I want to pray with you. Uh, so, um, and uh, then we'll jump right into it, uh, to this book. It's, this series, this book is out of the book of Nehemiah, so we'll be walking today just briefly through the uh, first chapter. I want to make sure that um, I don't hold you long. Uh, <laughs> that's an inside joke, but um, you know, I've been known to be long-winded as a preacher, so we want to be timely today. I'm working on it. Uh, Y'all help me to work on that. So let's pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, we are grateful again today uh, for the opportunity to be let down into the deep treasures of your word. We pray that you help us um, out of this study through the book of Nehemiah and um, coupled with the uh, Dan Sutherland's book, um, Leaving the Church with the Change, Transition. So be with us. Uh, allow your word uh, to speak to our hearts. Uh, based upon what we're going through uh, during this uh, transition period, as well as um, the shelter at home in which uh, we are now uh, a part of. We love you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to um, start out by um, kind of giving a brief overview of, uh, of the lesson. Um, you know, and this is just a lot of this book, uh, this book deals with, you know, changing, um, you know, operationally and, and uh, style and all of that stuff in which we do. But it also uh, has some good points um, in, you know, transitioning a church, uh, even if you're going through a pastoral transition or operational transition. Um, it, it has a lot to say. Uh, to the to the body um, at this time and and using the backdrop of Nehemiah and the transition that they were going through I think it's good for us uh, to share that with you um, one thing that I like uh, in the opening of the book talks about two boys um, and, and so this is just a review for those of us who've already been through it uh, so that we can pick it back up and not miss a beat. So I just need to, I want to review this first chapter and review chapter two and uh, we'll go on from there because I think it's good for all of us to get. So um, he opens the book by talking about two boys who have um, both been given a piece of wood. I think uh, those of you who've gone, read the book already know. And he says the boys began to whittle whittling away and uh, both are whittling hard both are enjoying their task and they're whittling 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 and um, uh, at the end of uh, both boys whittling one uh, when the finished work is done uh, one person um, whittles his block of wood down to almost nothing um, the second boy uh, whittles uh, his block of wood into a ship um, and the question is asked what's the difference um, you know what is the difference why one boy uh, whittled his block of wood to just down to a stick and the other whittled his into a ship 
Um, and the difference is that one had vision and the other did not. Uh, one had a finished product. He saw in his head what he wanted and his heart, and he began to whittle that. The other boy had no vision, had no uh, concept of what he wanted his finished work to look like, and so one boy had a ship, the other boy had just whittled his block of wood uh, down to nothing. The point that the book makes on this is that, um, is that uh, some churches are just whittling away, uh, no vision, you know, and that's not everybody, and that's not all of us. Um, even at times, our church, we struggle with, with casting vision and then staying on task and, and all of that. Um, so I'm not talking about any church in particular. I'm just suggesting, you know, just whittling away. We're whittling away just having program after program, doing, um, you know, service after service. But what is the intention? Where are we headed? What is the goal? Can we point people into the right direction in which we're trying to, you know, in a sense, carve out um, uh, exactly what God wants to do with with our church? And um, you know, a lot of churches just whittling away. A lot of you know um, people just whittling away, and while uh, folk are going to hell in a handbasket. And so. Uh, this this book deals a lot with vision, and so that we're not just whittling away; we're whittling, whittling with purpose and intention. Uh, we're trying to get a job done. Uh, we have vision that's out there that we are striving for, and you already know that without vision, people perish. I know that's a rough interpretation of that scripture, but um, you know that that if we don't know where we're going. Um, it's hard to get there. So the book helps us to lay out vision, especially when you're doing, going through transitions in your church or operations or however. So um, I, wanna, I want to um, help us to see that when we talk about vision, uh, in a number of cases, vision really is an active process. It's an ongoing process. It's not stationary or stuck. Uh, vision is ongoing. It's, it's continually trying to search uh, for God's will for that particular body or that particular church. Um, not every church can do everything, but, um, but if, if, if God has given that church or that pastor the heart for a certain area, you know, um, I think it's important that we realize that we ought to search for, see what God wants to do with the church. And, um, you know, even while we're going through uh, this pandemic pause, um, you know, I think God is speaking. I think we can say that. God is speaking. He's leading the church in many different ways. Um, and uh, we, you know, we understand that here, even at the church in which uh, I've been called, you know, we've had to uh, do certain things that we probably should have been doing all along to get ourselves ready for uh, this present age. Uh, but it, it's God speaking, and God is speaking uh, through all of this. So, um, and I want to highlight just the, the major points of, of the book um, because um, one of the things that he, um, the author gives us, he talks about um, the art of spiritual surfing. He talks about that we got to see the wave, catch the wave, and ride the wave. That, that's the idea of God is already doing something. We got to see that wave, we got to catch it because in doing this pandemic pause, God is up to something. We gotta catch what God is doing, get us ready, and then we gotta learn how to ride that way now. That's the art of spiritual surfing, and, and so, um, you know, how do we do that? And I think the first thing that the book tells us in chapter one, out of the book of Nehemiah chapter one, is that you've got to prepare uh, for vision, you gotta prepare for transition. I think I said it uh, this Sunday, is that you gotta set a plan. I think that's what God told Joshua. You know, he had a plan for him. He told him what he wanted him to do. Uh, it was a set plan. And uh, Joshua followed that plan in chapter 1. And so we have to have, we have to prepare ourselves for the vision. And that's that's where um, I want to land today. I don't, I don't want to go too far back over review, but I want us to remember these points. I think it's clear. Um, 
because the steps of preparation is first uh, we have to collect information and that's what we see in the text of Jeremiah is that Jeremiah collected information it says uh, here in the Bible it says the word of Nehemiah the son of uh, Hakaleah uh, it says now it happened in the month of Cheslev in the 20th year as I was in Susa the citadel that Hanani one of my brothers came with certain men of Judah and here it is he says I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the exile concerning Jerusalem and they said to me the remnants there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame and the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Nehemiah when his brother and this is his biological brother according to chapter 7 of Nehemiah um, uh, he asked him how, how what's going on in Jerusalem we already know that by the time we get to Nehemiah as Ezra writes this um, this there have been already two um, returns to Jerusalem um, and uh, when Nehemiah goes it'll be the third uh, return back to Jerusalem after uh, the children of Israel were in slavery for 70 years um, but but so his brother comes he asked him how the text says he he asked them concerning the Jews who had ex escaped and had survived uh, the exile concerning Jerusalem. And they told, told him what, what it was um, that was going on there. It says that, uh, he said, they, the remnants in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. And um, so he's collecting information. And I think that, you know, if, if we're preparing for um, transition, um, the important thing is that we got to collect the information. We got to collect, you know, we got to go to school. I think the book says, um, you know, that there's vital principles that, you know, that we should know that if we're going to transition right, we're going to a pastoral transition. You know, so it's the idea of collecting information about, you know, different pastors and what it is that the church was looking for. Um, and all of that uh, operational stuff. So we begin, you know, uh, looking at how we did things. Um, the book says this, that if you're not willing to go to school, it says you really shouldn't lead a church to change. In other words, you know, you got to know why you're changing or what you're changing to or what's the transition. It's, it's, about, um, it's about, you know, preparing properly. Um, and so Nehemiah, in these first three verses, he collects the information and he gets the idea that, um, you know, the walls are still down, the people are, uh, and the gates, um, you know, are destroyed by fire, um, and that they are in great trouble and, and shame. There's a reproach upon it because the walls are down. I like the way my uh, pastor, when I was at Bishop College, uh, Dr. Bailey, uh, when he preached this text, he said, the laws are down. <laughs> uh, I like that uh, because, um, you know, we, our walls are down. Um, but uh, you're collecting the information. Here, here's what we got to do as a church. We got to collect information, one, on the community um, in which we are ministering. You know, we can't assume that, you know, our, especially here, in uh, San Francisco and even in Sacramento, uh, the predominantly African American communities are not predominantly African American anymore. Um, so we got to collect information, you know, on our community. We got to know the makeup of our community and who we're trying to reach, you know. And um, we got to go to school. And I believe that you know we'll be surprised at what we find. Uh, when we go to school on our community here in uh, San Francisco, um, it uh, it is a great migration of the African American out of the Bayview Hunters Point, and uh, there is uh, much I don't know if this is the proper way to say it much gentrification going on. Um, whereas um, you know when I first got here 23 years ago, it, it wasn't it wasn't that, but. 
Um, so we got to go school on our community. We got to go school on the unchurched. You know, there's a way. Our brother told me yesterday, going to my friends, is that you know how we doing these uh, snippets and sermons now is appealing to a different generation because you know they're not used to sitting in church and all of that, but they are um, you know uh, shorter sermons or whatever is you know is appealing. Uh, to a certain generation, and you got people looking in uh, that never looked in before. So, the, our community and, and the unchurched people that are out there, um, you know, we got to go to school on them. And, um, you know, so it's good to go to school and find other ministries that are doing what you believe God has called you to do. Um, you know, and you got to talk to people. That's that's collecting information so that you are um, at the, you know, doing what you believe God has called you to do. Um, we got to go to school on, on how to do things of excellence and technology. So you got to collect all this information. That's that's part first one of preparation. The second thing is uh, in the text we see that Nehemiah had a holy discontent. That's in verse four. And it says, as soon as I heard these words, this is Nehemiah, he says, I sat down, I wept, and I mourned for 40 days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He says, he says, when I heard the words, hear me, he says, I sat down, I wept and mourned. The text says he did it for days. Um, he, he got, he got a, a holy heartache. When he heard that the walls were down in Jerusalem, he, when he heard that they were in reproach, that they were in shame, and um, you know, and, and in great trouble, and that uh, the gates were this you know, were burned with fire, Nehemiah got a holy heartache. He got uh, he got uh, holy got a holy discontent uh, with what was going on, and um, you know, uh, he was heartbroken of what was happening. Uh, after all of this time that the walls were still down in Jerusalem. So not only did he collect information when his brother Hananiah came, he also, uh, the text says, he had got holy, a holy discontent. Uh, his heart was broken. And if we're ever going to transition properly, we got to see things for what they really are. And it's, there's some things, and I've said this um, as we study this lesson, it's got to bother us, you know. Um, when we look at our community, um, we're having church on Sunday morning uh, while there are folk um, who don't know the Lord on a regular basis. And we're having a good time on Sunday morning in church and on Wednesday in Bible study. But, but our, when we look at our community, are we really, are we really heartbroken and uh, are there heartaches based upon what is going on? You know, really in San Francisco, it ought to bother us, the cost of living, um, you know, to live here, uh, the normal uh, person of color, uh, black and brown people, it's tough to live in the city of San Francisco, um, you know, and they have to migrate out. That ought to bother us. That ought to bother us that our schools uh, system is not where it should be as it relates to educating our African American. There ought to be some kind of are, are the black and brown uh, students, are the people of color um, and we don't have money to send them to private schools and all of that. Um, that ought to bother us, you know. Um, even the black on black crime, uh, even in the Hispanic community and um, others, you know, we, we, there are certain aspects of our community that we ought to have some kind of holy heartache, holy discontent, I guess I can say it like that, um, because that's what he did. He sat down, Nehemiah sat down, and he wept and mourned. The Bible says he did it for days. I like that. Um, it wasn't just a one-time thing. It was a, it bothered him. Um, about and he knew that something had to change. You know, our economic uh, disparity that is going on within our community, the our, the inequity, um, you know, and the social uh, political world, uh, the, um, unrepresented in many aspects. And it ought to bother us. The question that we've got to ask is this: 
Uh, when's the last time you, um, you know, you were heartbroken over the conditions of your community, uh, whether it be um, your church community or your the community in which you live, even the church community, some things ought to bother us, um, that we are not farther along than we should be. When God said that the gates of hell should not prevail against my church, he says, um, you know, are we a prevailing church or are we just existing from Sunday to Sunday? I know, and I'm not knocking this, but it's just the reality. There are, there are some churches in San Francisco that used to be full uh, now Somebody told me the other day, you could throw a rock, uh, a cow in, in, in the middle of the church on a Sunday morning and not hit anybody uh, for about five, six, seven pews. Um, there's some challenges and, and it's got to bother us. And so Nehemiah, he gathers the information. Uh, he, verse four, has a holy discontent. And then, um, you know, uh, in, in this holy that he wept, he sat down and wept and he mourned. It, it bothered him. It's almost as if somebody had literally uh, died. That word mourn is, is a death. And that's what, um, that's what Nehemiah was feeling. Listen, here's the question. Here's the, here's the reason why I believe he, you know, said that. Because, listen, vision and change and transition is usually birthed out of heartache. Is birthed out of of a burden when something um, bothers us so much that we say we can't go on like this. Something's got to change, and um, and I suggest that uh, that's how we ought to feel. We ought to we ought to change. You can't be content with the status quo, um, and um, and if that's the case, then it will never change anything if we're content with the status quo as long as we're comfortable or happy. The way things are, it's hard to hear God speak on something even different. It cannot be business as usual, you know, as long as the way things are, where they are, um, where people are dying uh, with no hope, um, they don't trust the church any way anymore, and they don't see a way out, you know, things have to change. And, um, you know, so vision often comes uh, during desperation. That's what Nehemiah seems he's at that place where he's, he's uh, in a desperate position. Um, so um, we see that in many different ways. You know, we got a hunger and thirst um, for God's blessing, God's best, um, that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, it's okay to have a holy discontent. You know, Jesus wept. Um, over the lost sheep of Israel. We know that Moses stood in the gap in Exodus 17, Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, you know, the condition of Israel. So, um, you know, it got to bother us. So uh, you got to collect the information. Um, there has to be a holy discontent. And then the third thing that Nehemiah did, the, the Bible says in verse 4, he says, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He, he fasted. That's the third thing he did. And if we're going to prepare for this, we try to hear from God. Nehemiah says he fasted. What, is, what does that mean for you and I today? Um, you know, uh, after Nehemiah received this devastating news, um, his next response was to fast. And for us, you know, it is an exercise that involves two things. It involves a giving up something and adding something. And so for some, it could be giving up television and adding uh, quiet time with the Lord. It could be giving up some food. Not everybody can do that, but it's giving up something in order that you can hear from God. So you give up uh, food or television or, you know, something that you're used to doing on a regular basis, radio, so that you can talk to God. You add a time where you can sit down and, and talk with God in prayer. And, um, and I believe Nehemiah separated himself. He fast separated himself from food. Um, he fasted. And, um, you know, we have to do that. Uh, we have to and fasting is the idea of seriously seeking after God. 
when you see all of these things that's going on within our community, you see all the things that's happening uh, within the church, um, how serious is it? Are you willing to separate yourself or fast towards something to hear from God so that we know what direction uh, God wants us to go in as a people? Um, how serious is it? Because you know, I like what the book says, that you don't find vision when you search for vision. You find vision when you search for God. And, and that's key. You know, I go, okay, God, what do you want? So so that fasting is not just, you know, we try to prove a point or say we can do this. It's not some spiritual exercise or endeavor. Uh, so much so that it is to hear from God. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking away something so I can concentrate more time on listening to the voice of God, whether it be an hour, a day, a half a day. And that cornerstone our deacons have been fasting on Wednesdays in regards to uh, to what God is doing with us through this um, through these this process of transition, because our goal is to hear from God. It is not our not my will as uh, pastor here. It's not their will as deacons. It's not even the membership's will. It is it's God's will that we want to be done, and so we're seeking God's. Um, and uh, part of that involves fasting. Um, here's the question we've got to ask is how serious are we um, in regards to wanting to know God's will for our life, the life of the church, and um, you know how serious do we want to be? So the next, uh, it says he collected information. When his brother came, he... Um, he, there was a holy discontent where he sat down, wept, and mourned, and then the text says he fasted. And then coupled with fasted, fasting, the Bible says that he prayed. That's the fourth thing. And if we're going to transition well, and this is all about transition, it's all about change, if we're going to do it well, um, prayer is always in order. Uh, Dr. H.B. Charles got a book out that says it happens after prayer. Um, we ought to do nothing uh, without uh, adequately praying to God. And um, one of the challenges with vision and change and transition is really hearing the voice of God. And that fasting, setting apart uh, time, it, it, it helps to eliminate distractions. Um, um, and that's why, you know, I like Psalms 46, verse 10, that says, Be still and know. That God says, be still and know that I am God. There's a stillness um, where we can focus on God and focus on what God is trying to say to us. Um, so we, we got to learn that, um, you know, we got we to gotta, we gotta fast and pray. Um, and this, this is just an overview of what we're trying to do and give us because um, we know that um, God has a will for our 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 way uh, our transition um, and we want to hear what God has to say and that fasting and pray um, um, we've got some key people in our congregation that are prayer warriors um, that are lifting lifting uh, our whole transition in prayer on a regular basis and I believe we all ought to do that um, we ought to do that um, we gotta, we gotta pray, um, P up, uh, pray until something happens. That acronym push, uh, push, pray until something happens. That means that we gotta keep on uh, taking it to the Lord until God speaks. We are gonna take time. And I, watch the text. He says, I, I sat down, I wept, and I mourned for days. And he says, I continue. Fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Get that. He, he kept on doing it. It's a continual fasting and praying. Um, because here it is. There, there are no shortcuts when it comes to vision, when it comes to transition, when it comes to change. There are no shortcuts. You can't cut around the corner. You know, um, you, you, you can't go up the cut down the block. You, you, you no shortcuts. God, God has a way. And our goal as a church, as a people, is that we want God's will to be done above everything. Here is, um, 
Here's the next thing that I, I want to give you that Nehemiah did. Uh, not only did Nehemiah collect information, not only did he have a holy discontent, not only did he fast and pray, but the fifth thing that he did, the text suggests that he waited. When you get to chapter 1, uh, verse 1, the Bible highlights um, the month of Chesnev, uh, which is... Um, is uh, December, uh, our December, and then when you get to chapter 2, um, it, it highlights um, the month of Nisan, is that Nehemiah prayed, fasted, talked to God in between Chislev and Nisan, and that's four months, Nisan is our April, four months, Nehemiah, what did he do in those four months? Here's what I, I think he did. He waited. He waited. He couldn't do anything until he heard from God. And a lot of times we want to rush through stuff. We want to rush through vision and change. And we want to, And that's why I'm so grateful for this pandemic pause is because um, this, this pause has caused us to pause. <laughs> that's a good way to say that. It's caused us to pause, you know. Uh, it has it is shifted our ideal of what we wanted and what we wanted to do, and, and we've got had to pause and wait till God unpacks and unfolds. And, um, you know, um, I like what the Bible says, that, um, you know, because we are in such a rush to get it done, but, you know, God is not in a rush. I like but we used to say it, he doesn't come when we want him. But um, if I was shouting right now, I'd shout somebody by saying, but he, he is always on time. I wish somebody could say amen right there. <laughs> he's always on time. And, um, and uh, he's never late. He's never in a rush. He knows what he's doing. And, um, and so we got to learn. Uh, we said it the other day is that, um, you know, we know that they that wait upon the Lord shall um, renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He's going to give us soaring power. We wait on God. And uh, he's going to give us uh, soldier power. That word run is the ideal of, um, you know, back in the day. Uh, Israelites didn't run unless they left running up the soldiers and um, they said they don't run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. That's staying power. Um, listen, beloved, um, I just wanted to, to give a, a you know overview of all that because uh, we go on God's will. The book talks about uh, kind of a, give us, a, us an overview of what God's will is, um, doing the right thing the right way. Um, and um, for the right motives at the right time. And um, the truth is, um, you know, it's all about timing. And it's all about God's timing because the, the first truth that he gives us, he gives these key truths, he says that rushed preparation always results in sloppy vision. If we rush through this, it's not going to be done well. It's not going to be done uh, with God's best or excellence. It's all about timing. And, and we're on God's time. We're not on our time. We want this done. Well, it's up to God. And we got to trust God to do that because um, timing is everything. The difference between a foul ball and a home run is timing. Uh, whatever hammer and Hank Aaron came up to the plate. Um, the difference between his home run and his uh, his uh, foul ball was timing. Um, and those of you who are Giants fan, I guess I'll say Willie McCovey or uh, uh, Willie Mays. I'll even give you Barry Bonds. Um, but uh, it reminds me of a story, and I'll be done, uh, of one time when the Milwaukee Brewers uh, were in the World Series with uh, the Yankees, and the famed catcher Yogi Berra uh, would always try to get into the uh, get into the 
the mind of the battles that were coming up. And so when Hammer and Hank Aaron came up to the plate, he yelled at him and said, uh, Hank, uh, uh, you're doing it all wrong. You're holding uh, the bat the wrong way. You need to read it so that you can uh, read the trademark. Uh, Hammer and Hank Aaron didn't say anything. And uh, the next pitch he hit uh, into the uh, left um, bleak, left field bleachers, the home run. And uh, as he rounded the bases and came to tap on first base, uh, he said to Yogi Bear, he said, um, I didn't come up here to read, I came up here to hit. <laughs> and, uh, I like that story. Uh, listen, beloved, if we want, we want to hit a home run on what God wants us to do, it's about timing. Like Hammer and Hank, got to be the right time. We got to do it in God's time. And I think that's what this is. We can't rush through it. We got to hang in there. Um, because if you rush through it, church will go through trauma. Um, you know, shock. And there's no guarantee that the church will come out, you know, without any injury or harm. You know, but you do it God's way. You wait on God. Uh, allow God to do it. Uh, allow him to work out whatever the details are. We're going to fast. We're going to pray. We're going to um, gather information. We're going to have a holy discontent. Um, and we're going to wait on God. That, that, is, that is summing up this, um, this first lesson. Uh, next week we'll be back on chapter 2. Those of you who have your books, I want you to read your book, chapter 2. And uh, we'll pick up from there. God bless you. And uh, we shall see you um, next week. Is that all right? See you Sunday. Y'all tune in to the Cornerstone broadcast, um, and we'll see you Sunday. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness, your grace, uh, for your strength and your mercy. You are a good, kind, and compassionate God. And even through this pandemic pause, um, we are so grateful how you have kept us. You have been our rock and our refuge. And now, Lord, even as we go through transition, um, we pray uh, just like Nehemiah. Help, help us to do things properly, decently, and in order. Help us to collect information. Help us to have a holy discontent that it cannot be status quo. We realize that, oh God. Help us to learn to fast and to pray so that we can set aside time to hear from you. And then, Lord, help us. Give us patience um, like Nehemiah to wait, and we know that if we wait on you, um, we shall mount up with wings like eagles, and we shall uh, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Um, thank you, Lord, uh, for what you're doing and will do. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Lifting up all those that are going through it right now, uh, specific members in our congregation um, that are dealing with certain issues of life, uh, lifting up, if we could, uh, Lord, uh, those that are on their sick bed and those that are suffering uh, through this, uh, this COVID-19. We love you, Lord. You are a good and gracious God. And in the wonderful name of Christ, we do pray. And together, all of God's children said, amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. God bless.